Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of In the Fish Tank with Jake and John. And today, what are we going to be breaking down, Jake? We're going to be talking largemouth. Anything from uh, fishing chatter fast baits, baits <laughs> chatter baits, you know, your square bills, spinner baits, drafts, slowing down, jigs, flipping Senkos. baits. We got everything today. Hold up though, what's the new product? Brand new shirt, uh, our classic tee, uh, brand new color. Super soft. Super soft. Oh, is it like the? Oh, it's like the yeah, it's athletic stretchy. material. Yeah. I like it. Awesome. Custom fit. Cool. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna break down largemouth fishing, as Jake said. So I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with how to cover water efficiently with some moving baits before we get into some of everybody's favorite slower, methodical techniques for really picking cover and picking areas apart. So. Um, I uh, hope you don't mind if I start off yeah, with uh, what we're going to start off with is some jerk baits because uh, it's kind of a good transition from smallmouth to use some Mega Bass Vision 110s. Yeah, did we talk about that last video? We may have talked about them a lot. So we're not going to cover a ton about them um, other than where we're going to fish them because if you want to see the gear that we threw it on, uh, you can just go back to uh, last week's video and check that out. So the big difference with these jerk baits, like I said, is where you're going to be throwing them. Uh, you're going to be targeting more grass lines, more shallow rock piles, your, you know, your sparse grass and your transitions that go from rock to gravel or rock to sand or sand to grass, any of that kind of thing. Hard, even, hard, hard structure. Yeah, yeah, hard structure and then just some of that, I guess grass technically counts as hard structure. But yeah, yeah you're going to be throwing them a lot shallower, um, at least up here anyway. If you live in some of those deeper um, red clear water reservoirs, you're still going to be throwing in those same places we were talking about with smallmouth because your largemouth just fill the gap that smallmouth would fill. You know, throwing them on your main lake points, your secondary points as they're transitioning back to spawn and then even around some of your spawning bays, which is where you'd throw like this Lucky Craft on uh, a shallower version. So that'd be a great way to cover some of that shallower territory because as those fish get ready to spawn and after they spawn, they have, uh, like I said, one thing on their mind and that's spawning and it can be, you get that post-spawn funk that people call it, or like that, that weird period where the fish really aren't feeding. They still are, but a jerkbait is a great way to trigger that. It's something that really grabs their attention. Um, that's something that's very underutilized in large amount of fishery as far as I'm concerned. Makes them bite on a reaction. Exactly. It's just a reaction bait that really gets them going. Uh, we'll talk about colors a little bit. Smallmouth, I get more creative with colors, but largemouth, I tend to keep it very standard. I have the water's a little bit tannic, I'm going to throw a white or a clear white, and then if the water is clear, I'm going to throw a shad color or something like this ghost shad. And then, you know, if I'm up shallow around some of those spawning areas, I'm going to throw a bluegill color, something that you know, just looks like what they're feeding on. But enough about jerk baits, I think we pounded that to death last yeah, week. Last week. Um, so, Jake, why don't you break us down some square bills? Go into some square bills. So, square bills, awesome to throw around that really hard cover. Uh, you can always throw it around grass and stuff, but um, it's a great bait for over top of grass beds. Yeah, for sure. Huge fan. Once you throw it out there and you get it, those treble hooks like stuck in a little bit of grass, you know, you stop it, you pop it right out of that grass, and that's another reaction strike. Um, yep. It's great around grass, that kind of stuff, but it excels around like rock and uh, hard wood and stuff because you can throw it way up inside uh, you know a, a tree or something and and burn it out and that square bill it deflects off a lot of things uh, so those those treble hooks they uh, they kick back a little bit and that that bill it allows it to be kind of you know kind of weedless almost uh, yeah. you can bounce it off trees and stuff if you keep it at a, at a good pace you can run it right across the tree and it'll, it'll run down like this and bump right across the top of the tree and come off the other side without being snagged. And that makes those bass go crazy. It, uh, it's a reaction strike, that really loud, you know, hard wobble in the rattles just makes them come out and grab it. A big thing that people don't realize when they're fishing wood like Jake's talking about is uh, a lot of times people try to burn it through there. And that, well, that can be a great deal. If it's a really, really big tree that has all kinds of limbs and stuff, you can do what you call worming a crankbait through a tree. And that's where you're going to want to keep it going nice and slow. You'll hit that limb and you just kind of pull your rod and it'll just pull it right over. Because what that bill does is that tilts the bait forward as it's getting caught. So it tilts it forward, getting those treble hooks away from the wood, and then it just rolls it right over it. And you can just, you know, pull it through all of those limbs. So that's a great, great technique. Same thing with rock too. 
Uh, like if you have a, a, a rip wrap structure uh, bank or something like that, that holds a lot of heat, especially in the spring, if oh, you're yeah. looking for warm water. And those sure. rocks, they, they're the first thing that heat up. Um, rocks and wood. Yeah, rocks and wood. But you can, you can go along, like especially along a dam, uh, that stuff really warms up. You can burn that crankbait right through there and try and bash it off as many things. I find if you if you bang your crankbait off of more things, it seems like you get more bites sometimes. I think a big thing you guys are going to start picking up on what we're talking about with some of these moving baits is reaction strikes. You know, We're not saying that you can't go throw these baits and just chuck and wind them, but it's just going to get you so many more bites by adding a little bit something extra to them where you're moving your rod tip a little bit, as soon as you hit something, deflecting it off of it, and just getting that bait to do something a little bit different because those fish try to key in on little little indices that those bait fish have when they're wounded or something like that. So yeah, even if that means just, I mean, keeping at a steady pace and then just speeding it up real quick. Making that crankbait go at a steady pace and then just burning it one time, making it kick off to the side, that, that can be the key sometimes. Huge trigger. I know you do that a lot with spinnerbaits. I do. Let's talk about some of the gear. I actually throw my spinnerbaits and my crankbaits on the same rod, so we'll kind of cover that a little bit because there's a big push in the market these days that everybody has to have these big parabolic bend rods that have all this give to them so it really lets the fish get the bait. And With some baits that's true, but it couldn't be further from the truth in a lot of cases. If you look at some of the, the pros like David Dudley, um, he's a big advocate for this. He throws a flipping rod for a lot of his like deeper crankbaits and then you get into some of your shallower stuff and you don't need that really that medium rod. A lot of those guys don't go below a medium heavy. So a rod that I really like to throw is a Shimano Claris. It's a 610, which is going to allow you to be more accurate around some of the shallow cover. Um, if I was fishing an open water situation, like around rip wrap and something like that, uh, I would go up to like a 7.1 or 7.2. That extra three inches doesn't seem like a lot, but it gives you a lot more castability. And the biggest thing about this rod is it is a medium heavy, fast action. Actually, I think it's a medium fast. Medium fast action. So. Even though it's a medium, it has that fast action. So it's going to have a little bit of give, but then you're going to have your backbone right away. And that's the biggest thing. Because if you're a bass fisherman, you've all had that heartbreak where you get a big fish to eat on a treble hook bait, you set the hook, like you reel into him, and then he jumps and pops off. And you lose it. We've all done it. Every single person has done it. And the main cause for that is your treble hooks are not getting past the bar. And the reason that is, is because of that parabolic bend rod. You know, those fish come up behind it, they suck it in because they have that force when they open their mouth to suck it in, unless you're small enough, in which case they just ram it as hard as they can. Yeah. But anyway, they suck that bait in and you lean on them, and a lot of times what happens is the front of that bait just hits the front of their mouth and they're just sitting there holding on to it. And as soon as they jump, they just basically spit it out. So that's why you go with a medium fast or a medium heavy because that gives you that little extra backbone to really hit those fish to get that hook point past the bar. Um, with a reel, so the rod, keep that in mind. The reel that I'm going to pair this with is 7, 2 to 1 in your favorite gear or your favorite brand reel. I love the Corrado K. It is just one of my favorite reels. Jake brought this one out. He's a right-handed guy, so this doesn't work for me. I'm real left-handed. But they're a phenomenal reel for the price point. I think they're $189 have a ton of them and they just perform at an extremely high level for their price point. Um, so what kind of line do you throw on this? That is a good question. So that's going to depend. Your square bills and uh, we'll get into some spinnerbait stuff here in a second. 15 pound is a good all around line for that. If you have one rod or you know a couple rods, 15 pound is going to get you where you need to go with most of your techniques. However, if I'm throwing that square bill around some really shallow cover, I'm going to be up in that to 20, maybe even 25. So a big thing that people don't think about with their baits is they go, oh, this is a shallow running crankbait. It's going to run 0 to 5 feet. Well, that's a, actually a big margin if you think about it. Where that 0 to 5 comes in is the line that you throw it on. So if I were to throw that on 8-pound fluorocarbon, it's going to get down to 5 feet. But if I throw it on 25-pound fluorocarbon, it's going to be more like a weight bait up in that 0 to 2 foot range. And then uh, your rod actually, your rod angle comes into play even more. If you pick your rod straight up and you're reeling it, it's going to lift that bait up in the water column and you're going to be running it like a weight bait, whereas if you point your rod tip down in the water, you'll get a couple extra feet out of it. For sure. I'm, I'm, more, of a, uh, I'm more of a rod angle guy uh, when it comes to that. I, I throw, when I throw spinner baits and the crank baits and stuff, I'm from like a, a 12 pound to a 15 pound. Um, 
with that 12 pound, I can get a little bit deeper uh, if I keep my rod tip down. But if I, you know, I, if I'm going down a bank and I have a, a little high spot or something, I want to get up on top of there. I'll just change my rod angle, keep my rod tip higher. Um, different angle won't make that bait dive as deep. Exactly, and it all depends on where you're at and what you're doing. If I'm fishing somewhere like Table Rock, one of those clear reservoirs, I'm probably going to run on 12 because I can use my rod angle like Jake says. But if I'm on somewhere like the Chesapeake Bay or you know the Delta out in California, I'm going to be running that bait on at least 20 pound line because the water's a little bit tannic, a little stained. I don't care that those fish aren't going to see the line and that's going to help me be more efficient covering water with that bait. So, square bills, great. Uh, color selection kind of goes the same thing with the jerk baits that we talked about last week. In clear water situations, we're going to run more natural see-through baits where those fish can't really get as good of a look at it. Uh, as the water gets more and more stained, we're going to be transitioning more to those hard colors with hard color lines on them. Like, if you look at this white shad color bait, you see that back is really dark and there's a hard line there. So yep. that gets that uh, attention of those fish as it rolls because they're just that hard transition. I, I really like, there's kind of three colors when it comes to square bills. Let's hear it. Craws, shad slash minnow imitators and then bright chartreuse blue back yep or or red yeah sometimes. if you're in the spring and yeah. you're in dirtier water something yeah throw sure. red but that kind of breaks down square bills uh it's an amazing tool to cover water it's one probably i want to say it's up there with the most money in any major tournament series back when kevin van dam was really in his prime yeah. that was a huge bait because that was People didn't have the electronics that we have today, and if you don't have the electronics, you got to feel it out, and that's what those crankbaits do. You know, you can run along the bottom, and you know it when you hit something uh, because it deflects off of there, and that's when you get your bites. So, great tool. With that, we're going to transition into spinner baits a little bit, uh, and like I said, the colors are going to be pretty much the same thing all across the board, with some minor exceptions across the way. But spinner baits. I'm going to start with the gear. We're going to run in with 15 pound line again, like I said, or 12 if you want to get it down a little bit deeper. This is one of the new Strike King spinner baits. You can see it's got a double willow leaf on there. And uh, one thing I'll talk about before I really get into anything else is the blades. You know, what do you look at when you look at with spinner baits? There's all different kinds of them. You know, there's big ones, there's small ones, they have all different kinds of blades. They have willow leaves, Indiana leaves, Colorado blades. What's the difference? So, willow leaves are for clear water situations or bigger willow leaves can be used for dirty water situations if you have like painted blades on there or big gold blades. The bigger the blade, the more thump it puts off and the more those fish can feel it and the more it slows you down. So the bigger the blade, the slower you're gonna go. These smaller willow leaves really shine in clear water smallmouth situations or large mouth if there's a lot of bait fish around. That allows you to really move that bait faster and just imitate small balls of bait fish. So those bigger Colorado and Indiana type blades, those excel around dirtier water situations, you know, pre-spawn, dirty water, those fish are more lethargic, you can really crawl those blades. As a standard rule of thumb, silver works really good in clear water, gold is a little bit better in dirtier water. Florida, dirt, Florida water, gold is phenomenal. They even use it on their Indiana blades down there, or their uh, willow leaves down there. So those are the kind of the deal with those. Indiana blades, are just kind of an in-between. If you get a little bit tannic water and you feel like you need to put off a little bit more thump, that's where those are going to come into play. You can even add a little red kicker blade on there with your big Colorados. But that's kind of the debunking of the spinnerbait. That's going to let you know, okay, I'm fishing here. What kind of blade combination am I looking at? So that kind of helps you with that. As far as this spinnerbait goes, I would throw this up here for smallmouth. We're still up in Fairview, PA. You know, we got the smallmouth coming into the Lake Erie right now, into the bay, Presque Isle Bay. This is a great tool to cover some water when those fish start to get up on those shallow flats. You know, this bait is, uh, I think it's only like a 3 8 ounce. Yeah, yeah, 3 8 ounce finesse. So it's not going to be a real deep running bait. However, if I put it on a 10 pound line, it will run a little bit deeper. But that's going to be for a shallow water bait. If you really want to burn baits like this, consider going to like a 3 quarter or a half. Uh, that can be a really good tool. But that's kind of the deal with spinning. Do you have something you want to add real quick? Yeah, I just want to talk about trailers. Oh, absolutely. Break it down. So, like a Kitex Swim Impact, uh, that's an awesome trailer for it. Uh, and you were talking about slowing your bait down, too. Uh, I'll tell you that. Yeah, so if you throw a, a trailer on the back of your, your chatterbait, not only does it make your... Go back to 
Oh, uh, I'm sorry. We'll get to chatter baits in a second. Uh, if you throw a cha I, uh, spinner yeah. bait. I got you all messed up. <laughs> if you throw a swim bait on the back of a spinner bait, there we go. Uh, not only does it beef up your profile of your of your lure, um, it also will slow your bait down too. So, um, if you only have a couple spinner baits um, and for for some reason you just feel like you're you're burning your baits a little bit too quick. Uh, you could throw a trailer right on the back and you'll be able to feel it. It's, it'll slow your bait way down. It'll have a lot more action with that tail kicking. Um, and if you're getting around you know, bigger fish or you just feel like they're on eating bigger baits, uh, you know, big gizzard shad, uh, big bluegills or something like that, the trailer is, a, is an awesome way to go. You can also upsize your blades in that case. If you're uh, in the early spring, if you're around some big gizzard shad, put some big blades on there because it'll match the foam. But while we're on the topic of trailers, one thing I do want to talk about is one way to be more efficient with less spinner baits is your trailers, like Jake was saying. So depending on how deep you want to fish, you can change that with simply adding a trailer without changing anything else. So I really like to put a trailer on pretty much everything other than a double well leaf that I'm going to be burning for smallmouth. I will put a trailer hook on these because those smallmouth tend to swat at it a lot more. That's the only time I'll really put a trailer hook on there, especially if I don't have a trailer, because the trailer adds a target for these fish to get to on these baits. You know, the skirt's on there, but if you add a trailer on there, it just gives them something more to really get after. So, what I want to talk about with trailers, there's three kinds of trailers that I like to run. I like to run the Zoom, what is that? It's like a fluke stick or something like that. It's a straight tail trailer. It's, a, it's their spinnerbait trailer. Everybody knows it. Um, because that's a thin trailer, it doesn't do a whole lot other than add a little bit of something for those fish to get after, and it's not going to change the depth that that bait would run without a trailer. It's going to help that bait get deeper. Then I like to run a Kytec in there. What is it? There? What's their thin swim bait? The swing impact. The swim. The not the fat. Swim. Yeah, the swing impact. Because that has a smaller paddle tail on there, and it has a thin profile. So what that does is that gives it a little bit of extra action, helps lift it up a little bit, but I'm not really slowing that bait down. And with all these swim baits on spinner baits and chatter baits, I rig them upside down because those blades create dispersion with the water. It moves it around, so it's not getting that bait to kick as much. Whereas if you rotate that swim bait upside down, it's still getting the water on it, so it gets that bait moving. Now when I like to run this bigger swim bait or a normal fat swing impact, like a 3.3 or 3.8, is when I'm fishing shallow with the spinner bait because this will really slow my presentation down and really allow me to fish really shallow, really efficiently, if that makes sense, especially when there's dirty water. Um, if I really want to slow my bait down because I think the water's cold, or I think those fish are really tight to cover, that's what I'm going to do. And you can do that with every spinnerbait you have. So I can make this spinnerbait fish three entirely different ways just with trailers. So that's a great way to save on money and a great way to be more efficient when you're out on the water. For sure. I just want to add, I don't have one out here, I just want to add one more. Sure. Oh, um, right one now. of my favorites is the classic uh, Zoom Fat Albert Twister Tail. Oh, yeah. Like your Mr. Twister, that's one of my favorites. Everybody adds a Twister Tail. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. So, rods, like I said, I'm going to throw that same, that's a medium fast, a medium heavy fast is also a good action rod for that. You want a little bit of a tip on there where you can feel those blades thumping and still allow those fish to kind of get it, but you also want to have that backbone because it's a single hook bait, so those fish, once they get it, they got it, get them in the boat. Um, I, mean, I want to run that same. With these willow leaves, I'm going to run a 7 4 to 1 gear ratio reel because you can burn them a lot faster while still having a little bit of torque to really muscle those bigger fish. But if I'm using some of those bigger willow or the bigger Indiana and Colorado blade spinner baits, I'm going to run a 6 3 to 1 because those baits are slowed way down because that big blade thumping, I don't need a faster. If I have a fast reel, I find myself overworking the bait. So keep that in mind when you're running it. You can still get away with a 7 3 to 1 or a 7 4 to 1, but I have ADHD and I gotta feel like I'm doing something. Um, if I put a 7 4 to 1, I gotta force myself to slow down. I do not like doing that. So what I do is I just change the gear ratio of the reel to keep that same pace so that it's slowing the bait down without me even realizing it. So that's a big thing with that. But I think that about does that with spinner baits. Let's talk about some chatter baits. Yeah, let's talk about chatter baits. Chatter wagon, chatter hoo-ha. Uh, 
bladed jig, as a lot of people call it. Would you like me to take the lead, or do you want to yeah. take the lead? Oh, oh my God, I love these. So this is probably not my favorite color, but my favorite style chatterbait. This is the Z-Man Jackhammer. They're like 17 bucks a pop, which is ridiculous, but they're phenomenal. And you can literally do this with any kind of chatterbait. That's the Z-Man original, or is it the Elite? It's Elite. Elite. These are my two favorite chatterbaits because that's an awesome skipping chatterbait. Well, this one is more of a covering water chatterbait for me. But the trailers, same deal. What I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about basically the same thing as I did with the spinnerbait trailer. So I'm going to do it because you can do the exact same thing with those trailers. Thin trailers going to make that bait run deeper. Like I said, those bigger paddle tails are going to help that bait run shallower. It slows it way down. Colder water, those paddle tails are exactly what I'm going to lean toward because it's going to allow those fish to get it more and it's going to put off that thumb. But what is a chatterbait? Basically a jig with a blade on it. That's why people call it a bladed jig. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I have two types of rods that I like to throw it on. I throw, they don't make the rod anymore, but I throw, if I'm covering water, I throw it on a 7.4 medium heavy crankbait, yeah, crankbait rod because it really allows those fish to suck it in and I never lose a fish on it. And I run 15 pound line on that as well. Those fish suck that bait in and I hammer them. Again, medium heavy, I'm still having some backbone in there. But those fish will come up, suck it in, I can lean on them. I'm throwing an 8 2 to 1 gear ratio reel. That's a big shot for some people, but that's the reel that I like for them. Because, here's why, I fish on the Chesapeake Bay a lot. And I find that fish, when they come up behind a chatterbait, they eat it and move forward a lot. And if I were to use a stiffer rod, I would be just fine with a 7 2 to 1 gear ratio reel. But because I like that soft rod, I have to use a higher speed gear ratio reel to catch up to those fish as that rod loads up. It's just the combo that I like. If you wanted to keep running um, a medium heavy rod like we talked about with those spinner baits, you'd be just fine with that. Um, if you have one or two rods that you use, that is a great way to use it, without a doubt. But that's just what I like to use. Probably my favorite trailer for these baits is a Yamamoto Seiko or a Lake Fork Magic Shad. Lake Fork Magic Shad is what I lean to, but I don't think we sell those here. So, do we? The, uh, yeah, the Yamamoto Seiko is Seiko. It's almost the same thing. Yeah, it's almost the same thing. Great shad imitator. It has that lifelike wiggle as that blade is moving. It just keeps that tail back there wiggling. These baits are great around grass. That's where these baits really shine. You can still catch fish around rock, don't get me wrong, but this is designed to be a grass bait. That's what it was made for. These baits break free from grass like nobody's business, and they imitate shad and bluegill extremely well. Getting it caught in that grass again, just like a square bill and a, even a spinner bait. You know, get it caught in a, in a little bit of grass, you pop it right out, yep. and it comes out, and that blade just, you know, vibrates real quick. And that's they where you get it. a lot of this. Oh, they eat it. It's such a fun bite. They thump it so hard. So, when do I throw this bait? I'll throw it any time I'm around consistent grass beds and like that sparse grass, but it really shines in the pre spawn when those fish are up shallower. That is just when these things really make their money. Uh, like when Brian Thrift first came out with these baits or started making a known on the tournament scene, it, from that day forward it was just unbeatable. You know? And guys still win tournaments on these baits even though everybody who fishes tournaments has these jackhammers in their box. Yeah. The color selection is the same as it was with the spinner baits and the, the crank baits. You know, if I'm fishing shallow grass and there's shad around, like I'm on the Potomac River or something like that, I'm going to throw either chartreuse and white or green pumpkin. That's literally what I'm going to go with. Red has been a really big popular option lately. Oh, there's chartreuse and oh, white. It's hiding. It's hiding over there. Yeah, red has been a really big popular color lately. Fire craw, I believe it's called. I have a few of them. I've caught some big fish on them. Uh, dirty water is when I'll throw that. But other than that, you know, I stick with my green pumpkins, my beehive delight, and my chartreuse and white. That's what I'm going to go with. If you're fishing some of those mid country lakes, those clear water reservoirs that have shad in them, and the, you're getting up around those docks with those shad spawn and whatnot going on, I will drop down and go to a clearer color. They make a natural shad color oh, yeah. that's more translucent. If I'm skipping it around docks, I will throw that there because those fish see a million of them. And that chartreuse and white will get it done, but when everybody's throwing chartreuse and white, you need something to really set yourself apart. And they even came out with a new stealth blade yeah. chatterbait. I don't think we have any out here. We did. But I play with those a lot lately, and when you're in a crowded situation, it really can excel. I was fishing, not in the tournament, but I was just pre-fishing Mosquito Lake over in Ohio, and literally there was 
probably 70 or 80 boats, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it's a small lake, and I was still made, being able to throw a chatterbait in crowds and get bites, uh, which was something that's hard to do a lot of times in those small bodies of water. So I haven't played with a stealth blade. Does it kick as hard as the? Uh... No. So the blade is actually a, like literally half as small as this, and it's clear and it's made out of plastic. So that does two things. One. The plastic doesn't give it off as hard a vibration when it hits, or in the sound when it hits, because it's not metal to metal, it's plastic to metal. So it's a duller sound, the blade is half as small, so it's not putting off as much vibration, so it sneaks up on those fish. I've literally taken the bait and thrown it in a fish in ponds, and watched them not even know the bait's there until it's literally right behind them. And that's a great triggering method, because when that sneaks up on them, it triggers them again. That word, trigger. But, Great bait, uh, we talked about the rods, reels, line, 15 pound line. If you throw them real shallow, again, go 20, don't be afraid to play with that a little bit. You can do the same thing with the trailers to beef it up or slow it down. Same thing goes there. I know a lot of guys just throw a straight braid on them too during water. You could do that, but then you'd have to uh, put a slower taper rod on there. Yeah. Because a lot of times people tend to pull the bait away from the fish. If you were to use you know, a fast action rod with that braid, as soon as you feel that bite, you're going to want to set the hook. Well, that fish really hasn't even gotten that bait yet. You'll find yourself hooking them on the outside of the lip. Whereas if you were, to, if you want to throw a straight bait, put on a more parabolic bent rod, and you'll find you're hooking them like the back of the throat, which you're never going to lose in the back of the So unless you tie it to the not, but hopefully you never do that. Yeah. All right. I think that about covers it with our moving baits. That's really sick. We have some top water moving baits. We can cover to some of those. Oh, we got floppers and we got butt baits. So. If you're down in Texas, or if you're down, we don't have walking baits up here, but that's okay. We're gonna do the same thing. Really. If you're down in Texas or more of the mid lake, if your water temp is like 54 or above, I feel like that would be good. If it's like 53, 55, frog, where you're gonna want to be at, I'll talk about that in a minute. These are baits that are gonna be coming into play because you're gonna be getting those fish that are pushing up shallow, getting ready to spawn. It's just a different look that they haven't seen. If you've never thrown a whopper plopper, you're missing out. And if you've never thrown a buzz bait, you obviously don't bass fish. Because <laughs> this bait has been around forever. And I actually heard a funny story. When this bait first came out, there was a tournament. I can't remember. I was watching it on the Bass University. But uh, the guy who had it, one of the original ones, won the tournament and was talking to whoever the speaker was afterward. And he said, yeah, you got to make sure you reel this bait real slow, though, or else it tries to come up on top of the water. So he was actually fishing it like a spinner bait oh, wow. and smoking. He got like 20-something pounds. So... Um, you can see how far we've come since that. With buzz baits, there's, I want to say there's three different kinds? Yeah, so there's three different kinds. You can throw multiple blade buzz baits where they have two props. You can throw individual blade ones, and then you can throw these individual blade ones with a clacker, uh, which is just going to add more sound. And they all have their part, they all have their time. You know, it just depends on where you're at. You know, this, a clacker is a great way to catch fish in a pond, or a great way to catch fish in a less pressured situation. And you can see this one has a skirt built on it, so it's going to be hard to put a trailer on there. You really don't have to. Whereas if you buy some of the War Eagle ones or the Dirty Jig ones that just have a hook on there and a jig head, that's when you put that Zoom Horny Toad on oh, yeah. there because that's a great, great, or you kite or kite. That's also an awesome one if you're around a lot of shad. That's a great option for that. Whereas these skirts, they still get the job done, but it's a little bit different. Those buzz baits that have the, like the Horny Toad and those swim baits on there without a skirt, skip the phenomenon. Yep. Up. Awesome dog bait. Yeah, so where I'm going to fish those is I'm going to fish those around cover. I'm going to be beating the bank with them. I'm going to be fishing those in some place that the fish is up against something I'm trying to trigger it. This is great when those fish have seen every chatterbait and spinnerbait in the books. Same gear, uh, I'll run this on braid to a, monof or a monofilament leader or just straight like 25 pound monofilament. And I honestly like to run it on a crankbait rod if I'm casting it in the open situations or like open water, covering water, because it really allows those fish to pull it down. But if I'm around docks, I go with that same chatterbait spinnerbait rod where it has a little bit of a tip. Your favorite jig rod that you skip around docks. I, I grew up throwing a, a, a black spinnerbait on open weed beds. That was, that's like my earliest bass fishing memories oh, yeah. with, with my dad. You know, 10 years old, throwing a, a black spinnerbait. Buzz bait. Open, or, yeah, buzz bait <laughs> over, top of, over top of grass uh, at my home lake. That's, this one really hits home. Caught a lot of fish Good. on that bait. Now we're going to talk about some whopper ploppers. And where this bait really shines is in that post spawn period when those fish just got off beds and they're grouped up, grouped up in those wolf packs. Uh, I don't know if you watched it, but Jacob Wheeler won a Bassmaster event on 
uh, Lake Travis down in Texas using one of these baits in the white and the bone color version. And it just is a great triggering bait for when they're feeding on those shad, and it's just a different sounding bait, honestly. That's, that was the biggest thing when this thing first came out, was it just had a different sound to it, and those fish really keyed in on it. And honestly, I don't know what it looks like a lot of times. Obviously, it looks like shad, uh, but this black one, I'm not really sure what it looks like, but they eat it. Let's talk about it's these. It's just a big profile. <laughs> no, it's just fish are opportunistic. Those, those whopper ploppers, they have, they have more of a plopping sound. Than so like it's like plop, 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 plop. Exactly. Uh, compared to like a like a buzz bait or something that's you know typically pretty fast and yep. uh, kind of squeaks a little bit. This is kind of a real lazy, real lazy bait, but you still can burn. Absolutely. It. Okay. So one thing I want to touch on before I get too carried away because I kind of missed this as far as color situation goes with these top water baits. And you'll notice we only have two colors up here, and that's not by accident. We put them up here on purpose because we have black and we have white, and it's pretty much how it goes when it comes to top waters. I don't really pick a lot of different colors unless I'm throwing a clear water situation with a buzz bait, in which case I won't even have a skirt on there and it'll be a natural bait anyway. So, when do I throw these versus when do I not throw these? When I throw these certain colors, well obviously I throw them all the time, but I throw the black on more overcast, cloudy days, you know, closer to dark, and I'll throw the white on uh, clear clear days. But honestly, you won't really get a top water bite going unless it's anyway in that yeah. kind of situation but yeah I like the white on clear days and I like the darker colors on darker days just how it's worked for me and if you find a short striking one flip <laughs> keep everything simple I do that with my buzz mates I do that with my frogs that's kind of how that goes with those color situations I don't know if you've had any situations where you had it work better. I really like that that black like right before dark uh, that's one of my favorites yeah, so that'll be good with that. And the gear, I don't know if we touched on this or not. The gear we're going to throw with that, these ploppers, it's going to be straight blade, straight blade, straight braid uh, on like a 711 or a 76, depending on the size you're throwing with these. Uh, well, 76 flipping rod, sorry. And then I'm going to pair that with a 7 4 to 1 gear ratio reel because an 8 2 to 1 doesn't have as much torque as these 7 2 to 1s do. So, you know, pick your obviously, pick your favorite brand reel, but I like that for Auto K or, you know, Shimano. It's <laughs> just how we are. Um, but that's what I'm going to be using as a setup for that. And then we're going to talk about frogs a little bit because it's not really a, a find them bait unless you're in grass beds or around pads or something like that where you're covering water with it. Most of the time, this is a target oriented bait where I'm going to be throwing it at specific laydowns, at specific grass patches or grass points, or you know, over top of a bedded fish, something where. I'm going to be running that. So the gear that I'm going to run these on is going to be a 7-2 fast heavy action pretty much. <laughs> or you can throw it on a medium heavy fast. Something with that heavier action where you're really allowed to horse those fish out. And you can get away with a medium heavy fast in open water situations because you're not pulling those fish through cover. But if I'm fishing around heavy cover, I'm going to go to like a 7-6. Or you can still stay with that 7-2, but bump it up to a heavy fast. Yep. So you can actually pull those fish out. I'm staying with that same 7-2 to 1 gear ratio, or 7-4 to 1, so I can actually pull those fish out. And I'm going to run them in open water on 50-pound braid, and then in thick cover, I'm going to run it on 65-pound braid. I can't like fathom how many times I've had people go, why do you fish 50-pound braid for bass? You don't need it for those little fish. It's not about the size of the fish, it's about where you're trying to get them out of. Yeah. Um, so that's where you have to talk about it. like five pounds of grass on top of it. <laughs> I know, it's ridiculous. <laughs> um, on a side note, did you see Carl Jockinson's fish they caught on a frog? I, it was on Wired to Fish. I did see that, yeah. but I didn't watch it. I watched him find the fish, and then I had to go to work. So yeah. I was like, okay. I don't know. Yeah, it was ridiculous. On he a, found the fish on a frog, and then caught it on, uh, on a creature bait. On a topwater note, did you see Lee Livesey's 42-pound bag yeah. on Lake Fort? Oh. All on top water. He caught some on a big swim bait, but all on like a big walking style bait, which is another bait that I don't think we have one up here, but it looks like this, but it's a little bit more round and it doesn't have a bill on it. And it floats. <laughs> and it floats. So with a walking style bait, I'm going to be using basically the same rod as I would be with those square bills and whatnot, something with a little more tip to get that bait to walk back and forth. And I'm going to run that on 30 pound braid with a monofilament leader, like a 20 pound monofilament leader, something to give it a little bit of stretch. I'm going to be making long casts still with that same 7 2 one gear ratio reel, and that's the bait that I'll use in open water situations. That's the one that imitates bait fish better, and I can cover a ton of water with. 
It is phenomenal if you have a shad spawn. Obviously, if you're in Florida right now and you watch that Bassmaster event, throw a giant spook. Or not in Florida, Texas right now, throw a giant spook. Because you're going to catch big fish. I'd love throwing a walking bait over top of grass again. Exactly. Grass patches. Grass patches. Um, when we say like a walking bait, like a, like a, I mean, a heaven zero spook. That's, <laughs> that's like the OG one. That's the OG. Um, and then you can't, you can't go wrong. Uh, Lucky Craft, it, it makes a, they make a gunfish. Yep. Um, and then they make the, uh, this slender, or the, what's your other walking one? Slender. They, they have another version of Mega it. Megabass has their dog X. Yeah. That's awesome, also a good one. Awesome base. Big dog X if you're like in Texas or in Florida and want some big fish, big shad. Um, so that kind of covers our top water section. Let's break down some swim baits real quick. We're not going to talk a ton about it because we talked a lot about swim baits in the last video. And the only thing I will talk about in this one a little bit more is I like to go with more of a, a weedless swim bait because obviously we're fishing for green heads and not, it's not always around grass but there's a lot of situations where that is grass. Um, obviously if you're in those clear water reservoirs that don't have grass you can still stay with that open hook and fish it like how we talked about for smallmouth in that last video that we just did. But if you're up shallow around grass and up shallow around hardcover you're going to want to go with one of those weedless screw lock presentations that are going to give you uh, just more efficiency at covering water. Um, it'll allow you to get that bait through that thick cover. But we're going to break down some swim baits. So we just have some Kitech fast swing impacts, and then we have some this is six inch. So it's not a huge bait. Obviously, people get this mixed up with like a big bait, but like when you compare them, it's really not that much bigger. Like if you look at honestly, like look at this whopper plopper compared to that. People love throwing this, but then they're afraid to throw this. Yeah. That makes no sense to me. But let's talk about some gear with some swim bait rods. Honestly, I like a medium heavy. Medium heavy, maybe not a fast action. I like a little bit more tip to allow those fish to get it, but I still like that heavy act, that medium heavy to let me drive that hook home. Especially if I'm fishing one of those uh, weedless hooks. You know, one of those, uh, basically this, <laughs> with a uh, screw lock on it. One of those, one of those, a super long one. Or the owner makes a great flashy swimmer. They're on your spin hooks. Those are awesome for around cover and stuff like that. If you have bait fish, if you have a little bit, uh, a little bit more wind, you have some overhead cover, something like that. And when do you throw a swim bait? Let's talk about that first. Because everybody loves throwing jerk baits, spinner baits, chatter baits. This, these are basically your chatter bait, your spinner bait when the water's clear. This is what you're going to downsize to. Not downsize, but just shift over to. Because those fish are going to get a lot better look at it. And when that water's real clear, they can just get a better look at it. And honestly, no bait actually mimics a fish better than swim baits. None. And we talked about that in our last video. So that's what I'm going to do. And you can talk about the big baits because you have more experience on those than I do. But don't overlook a swim bait. Even if you're on the Potomac River, put a green pumpkin swim bait on there on the back of a swim jig and just drag it through that grass because you're going to get that tail kicking and rolling. And you may not catch 100 fish on it, but what it'll do is it allows you to cover water in areas that are expansive in those big grass flats and those green and those big pad fields in just big mud flats, you know, if you're around a lot of cover. Fishing that swim bait will get you bites, and then you can go back in with video or with baits that we're going to talk about in our next video. We're going to do a little spoiler alert. We're going to break down all these fast moving baits today and then go back in and slow it down next week. But it'll get you bites to let you know where those fish are at. And that's what it's all about. And when you're around the shad spawn and stuff, though, too, this is fire. Like, this is awesome. I wouldn't throw this one, maybe. I would, like, upsize it. But these swim baits are awesome at skipping around docks and they're also awesome in deep water. You can fish these in literally every column that you want. Just upsize your head to match where you're fishing. So, who would you like to touch on? This is one of my favorite colors too. That's Ghost Rainbow. Yeah. It's supposed to kind of look like a rainbow trout. Shit, it looks it nothing like a... <laughs> it looks like a shad. <laughs> yeah, it looks like a shad. It looks like everything. Um, I'm not trying to bash you guy tech because it's a phenomenal swim bait. But yeah, that's it's never such seen a, a rainbow great trout look like that. Correct. Um, but big baits, uh, this is my cup of tea, man. I love it. Um, I throw it a big swim bait. I'm kind of like a big crankbait rod. Um, right. So uh, kind of a moderate rod. So especially with this mag draft, it's an awesome, awesome bait. Uh, it has a treble hook in the bottom of it. You can't really see Magnetic that. keeper on there too. For sure. Um, it has a magnetic keeper on the bottom of it. So uh, the, the treble hook actually sticks to that uh, that bait all the time. So uh, once it's still an exposed treble hook, but when that fish comes up, 
and it grabs the, the treble hook. It, uh, it gets off of the, the, the magnet that's in the bottom of the swim bait, and uh, you just get a much better hook set. Um, I like that, that little bit more of a crankbait rod because I am still throwing a treble hook. Um, I like that, that, that slower action when they come up and they're, you know, they're, they're head shaking and you're trying to grind them to the boat as fast as possible. That softer rod will absorb their head shakes a lot better. Um, I will add one thing. If I'm fishing for smallmouth, I like a little bit stiffer rod. And the reason for that is with largemouth, when they come up and get it, they're honestly just like sucking that whole swim bait in, you know, they're eating it. But those smallmouth, their mouths are like that big. A lot of times they're not coming up from behind the bait and sucking it in. They're just like hitting it hitting like they're it. slapping at it. So that stiffer rod, what it does is it kind of acts as a hook set for me. Because when those fish hit it, if you have some cushion in there, a lot of times they can like pop that hook point off real quick. But with that stiffer action, they hit it and get stuck right away as I'm reeling it. So that's why I like throwing that stiffer action rod for smallmouth. But Continue on, yeah, for smallmouth, I, I still like that that softer rod. Uh, just different opinions, yeah. uh, because even I kind of act like a. We're getting yelled at for time. Don't worry, we're gonna keep going. All right, we're gonna keep going. <laughs> um, we'll keep it short. Yeah, I'm just gonna with that big swim bait. When I get that bite, I mean, I kind of reel down to him real quick and then load into him. I don't swing for the fences like a jig. I, I you know? for the yeah, I, I I tend to lose a lot of fish that way. I think, uh, especially when I'm fishing like that mag draft. The only thing that I have a problem with the mag draft is is that it's not very heavy. It doesn't have an internal uh, weight system. That's fair. So you it's a shallow water bait for sure. Um, I like fish for weightless. I like it uh, fishing deep water though. Um, and one way I do a little modification on it is I get uh, rains. Uh, Rains makes little tungsten Nico nail weights. weights. Yeah, like it's actually for a Nico rig, and you just stuff like a whole crap ton of them into the bottom of it, um, and that, that lets you get a little bit deeper with okay. it. It sinks a little bit quicker. You're able to get a little bit better bottom contact, um, and uh, it, it lets you swim it a little bit faster. But if I'm just fishing around, you know, wood, rock, even grass, uh, I don't, I don't really keep put the weights in it. I have, you know, my weighted swim baits and then I have just my normal ones. Um, if I'm fishing around wood, I can throw it way up inside of it and slow roll it keep with that that rod angle too. These are awesome skipping baits. They too. are, they're phenomenal at that. You can skip that bait way up underneath of a dock too. And I mean, it drives those dock donkeys. <laughs> All right, before we, before we go, I do want to say where you throw this bait, is the same places and the same situations you would throw a spinner. That is a big key with that. But we're getting cut short on time here, so that's actually all the time we have for today. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video today, and uh, if you have any questions, as always, throw them down in the comments or DM us. And uh, be sure to follow along for our next week's episode on, you know, finesse baits and, you know, really dialing down how to catch these fish once you've found them. So, th again, thanks for watching, and uh, hope to see you out on the water. Thank you, guys.